Many Westerners feel that today they have a duty to pursue this struggle till the end, to abolish racial slavery wherever it still exists. And where does it exist? Indian caste system. You see, because of the Aryan invasion theory, uh, many people think that the caste system is some kind of apartheid imposed by the white Aryan invaders upon the dark aboriginals. There's much uh, scientific evidence against this scenario, but anyway, that's what popularly is still believed. And so that is a fertile soil for the, um, the, the Hindu bashing propagators. So, I mean, most people are not really concerned about India. You know, there is in India this, this story that the, the West is against India and they don't want India to come up economically and so on. You see, this is all self-flattery. This is giving India far more importance than it has. India is doing very well, it is gaining in importance and so on. But that has nothing to do with the existence of Hindu bashing. And um, so it, it has certain explainable reasons. And so this, this fertile soil of a desire to abolish racial slavery is a, a large part of it. Well, you see, there is the story, of course, that Islam has brought equality. Ever since um, Mohammed Habib, the historian in the 1920s, and M.N. Roy, the founder of the Communist Party, also at that time, the Indian masses were yearning for Islam. They wanted to convert away from the oppressive Hindu caste system because Islam promised them equality. Now, this is totally unsupported by primary evidence. And indeed, you see what we know about the processes of conversion. And I don't mean conversion at knife point, but you know, formally voluntary con conversions, again, have, still have nothing to do with this factor of in, uh, inequality. Or rather, they do have to do with inequality, but in the opposite sense. The fact is that under Muslim rule, it was an advantage to be a Muslim. For example, if two Hindu businessmen had some business conflict and they went to court, then the one who was the first to convert to Islam would automatically win his court case. Or for example, many urban craftsmen who are the bulk of Hindu converts to Islam uh, had better chances of employment at the Muslim courts if they converted. So it was always an advantage to convert to Islam. Same thing under Christian rule, uh, under the Portuguese especially, even to some extent under the British. You see, the, the British didn't actually practice conversion, but certainly the missionaries had the ear of the colonial authorities. So in some situations, again, it was advantageous to belong to the Christian community. There has never been a time in Indian history when the Hindus were oppressing the minorities. You see, this is a familiar trope among the, the Hindu bashing crowd, but this has never existed. You see, what this is, is a pure projection of essentially the American situation. You see, whether affirmative action is the correct policy uh, as an answer to the historical fact of uh, oppression of the blacks, that is a, a political question that has to be decided today by the people concerned. But the historical fact that the blacks have been oppressed. Now, that is there. You can't deny that. Well, there is no corresponding fact like that in India. The Hindus have never oppressed the minorities. The Hindus have nothing to, to compensate, to, to historically pay for or something.
क्षमा कीजिए कि मैं अंग्रेजी में बोल दूंगा इट्स ओनली इन इंग्लिश मे बी सम पीपल कैन अंडरस्टैंड दैन हुट अंडरस्टैंड हिंदी एंड एस दे से ऑन इंडियन एयरप्लेन्स नाउ डेज गुड मॉर्निंग लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन बॉयज एंड गर्ल्स और मे बी दे से गर्ल्स एंड बॉयज बिकॉज दिस इज अ स्ट्रेंज थिंग that even though men and women nowadays are supposed to be equal nevertheless a custom from the days when they were not deemed equal is very much insisted upon namely that you name the ladies first and only then the gentlemen but okay this is the way it is so today we're going to talk about the claim that uh, hindus are constantly confronted with namely that monotheism has brought equality and so um both from the biblical and from the quranic side this is uh, nowadays constantly held against uh, hinduism is fairly modern because egalitarianism has only become a concern essentially with the french revolution and even then pretty localized so on a worldwide scale 19th century even 20th century it's a very modern thing you see the missionaries in the old days were concerned with this so uh, worldwide different classes were recognized uh, this already starts in in uh, prehistoric days when tribes were uh, composed in a very simple manner where more or less everybody had to do the same things yet even then there was a hierarchy there were the the alpha males on top with a group of women around them then down below were let's say the beta males who did not have access to the women like young men first of all uh who had to suffer the ignominy that all the young women were taken by the alpha males so they uh they formed groups on the outskirts of society essentially encouraged to uh to raid other tribes uh so in a way this was uh this was a plus for those societies that they made use of the poverty of a certain group of their own tribesmen in order to expand their territory their their reach of power um you could see it even today in indian communal relations where unlike the hindus or the christians the muslim community has a right to polygamy which of course limits the choice of women for the poor muslim young men but they are encouraged to uh to predate to uh to raid the hindu community for their women this is the so called love jihad so this is in fact a modern incarnation of something that has existed between tribes since the prehistoric age um then in the neolithic the the start of agriculture you have the emergence of a real class society where you have a ruling class you have free men and something that also appears at that time slaves you also see in many societies the emergence of a separate priestly class and so there are different rights and different duties for each class they are differentiated since fairly early on you also have some very few egalitarian thinkers who start small utopian experiments little communes where they experiment with a different structure of society this is only blips uh nothing no enduring egalitarian society now in monastic communities as soon as these uh, start which in india is very early 
uh, at least 1000 BC, but probably earlier. There, of course, you don't have all the complexities of family life. You don't have to marry off your daughter, for example. So you don't have to be concerned with the social rank of your potential son-in-law and of all the other families that you do business with. Uh, so there, a certain amount of equality is possible. And indeed, that's what you still see in the Hindu sannyasi or renunciate class. They drop their family name, which maybe outsiders don't know, but Hindus do. They contain information about your caste background. You see, usually from the family name, you can deduce what caste somebody is from. Now, that family name is given up when you enter a monastic structure. Instead, you get a monastic name, which doesn't contain this information. And you, um, you know, this is a, a typically Hindu uh, custom. You do the funeral rites for yourself. You see, you abandon the person you were before you entered the monastery. So this entire caste history is erased. So there you have an amount of uh, egalitarianism within the monastic structure, but it doesn't uh, impinge upon the rest of society. Uh, among the experiments with egalitarianism, we should uh, mention the movement by Mazdak, uh, a reformer in Iran in about uh, 400 uh, of the common era. Similarly, you have an egalitarian commune with He Xinyin in 1553 in China. Uh, you start getting some communes in 19th century Europe and North America. But so this is all blips on the outside. And so inequality is taken for granted pretty much everywhere. So what does the Bible say? Is the Bible an example of egalitarianism? That's how it is sold nowadays in India, especially among low caste and tribal communities. So what we find in the Bible is that there is a traditional hierarchy of age. The old men deserve the respect from young men. Of sex, of course, women are subordinate to men. And of social rank. Then there is an ethnic hierarchy so the, the, the chosen ones are the tribe uh, or the tribesmen themselves of the, the Israelites. Then the foreigners who live among them, in Hebrew, the Gerim, uh, they uh, are subordinate to the Israelite uh, tribal structure. So they are allowed their, their own separate identity. To some extent, they're separate Moors. But at any rate, they cannot uh, change at all the existing Israelite uh, tribal structure. These Gerim are distinct from the real foreigners, which are the Goyim. The Goyim means the nation, the nations. So these are the real foreign nationals, the non-Israelites. And so for them, uh, totally different uh, structures are acceptable. For example, in uh, the Israelite society, there is a strong movement in favor of strict monotheism, which will ultimately prevail. And so that counts for the Israelites, not for the Goyim. You see, the Goyim are, for example, uh, accepted uh, according to the Bible itself, to worship sun, moon, and stars, whereas the Israelites are not. The Israelites can only worship the Creator God, not any creature which the sun, the moon, and the stars are. But so there is a, a strict hierarchy. Of course, the Israelites value this monotheism much higher than the polytheism of the nations. But so, 
this may be important to, to understand for Indians. Uh, at that time, the Israelites start uh, monotheism, start iconoclasm. They don't want any idols around, any murtis. But that only counts for the Israelites. So when Moses discovers that 3,000 fellow Israelites are worshiping the golden calf, that is to say a, a bull god, namely Baal, who is then given a murti in the form of the so-called golden calf, uh, for which they very generously donate their jewels to be reforged into this golden calf. Then he is angry and he has them all killed. But so that's because they are fellow Israelites. If any foreigner does it, well, you know, they can only shrug and remain unconcerned. That's a big difference with the role Christianity and Islam have played in Israel, uh, in India. Sorry. Um, okay, so uh, the Israelites initially, uh, once they, according to the Bible, have uh, left Egypt, they live in the chosen, uh, the chosen land without any uh, structure of kingship. They are ruled by the judges. But you see, they are a bit jealous of the neighboring nations that do have a king. They want to have a king themselves. And so finally, uh, with the help of a prophet, they make Saul their king. Then um, Saul doesn't please uh, Yahweh sufficiently, so he's deposed, and then David becomes the king. But so at any rate, they choose kingship, and thenceforth they have a king until they are uh, defeated by the Assyrians and then the Babylonians. They're sent into exile, and so then they have no political structure anymore. Uh, kingship disappears which is when an ideology starts about the Messiah. The Messiah, or in Greek, the Christos, the Christ, means the anointed one. And this refers to the crown prince who is ritually readied for his coronation. Uh, so it means a descendant of the house of King David that will restore the kingdom of Israel. That's the essential meaning of a Messiah. In Christianity, it acquires a different meaning. But here it is a very worldly institution. It means restoration of the lost kingdom. Okay, now slavery in Israel is a matter of course. There's no one who doubts the legitimacy of slavery. Uh, the, um, the only limitation is that there are injunctions to treat slaves well. And so some, some Christian propagandists in, in India are going to insist that this is a, a form of abolitionism. No, it is not. It means that you make slavery more enduring. You see, if you treat slaves harshly, they may rebel. And so to avoid that to make the institution of slavery more stable, you shouldn't impose any unnecessary hardships on them. You know, you may force them to work for you. Otherwise, you see, you, you treat them well, because that way they can more or less make peace with their status of slaves. So this institution of slavery is approved and sometimes ordered by God himself. Something that may really surprise you is that there is actually an ideology of caste division in the Bible. You see, and it goes quite deep because it is the human application of a deeper and wider ideology of separateness. It is said in the book of Leviticus, you shall not let your cattle breed with a different kind. You know, you, you have these, uh, these interspecies uh, breedings like uh, 
a stallion with a donkey mare. You see, he gives a, a mule, which is uh, sterile, but which at any rate can exist uh, itself. Uh, so you can have a species, close species interbreed. Well, according to the Bible, you should not do that. You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed. You see that this is something that, that farmers do. You see, sometimes it is useful for the agricultural production to have two species sown in the same field intermingled. Well, you should not do that. Nor shall you wear a garment of cloth made of two kinds of material. You see, in modern clothing shops, you, you will find uh, like some, uh, some artificial tissue mixed with cotton or mixed with wool or so. No, you should not do that. So it is an anti-mixing uh, ideology. Anti-sankara, you see in the Sanskrit scriptures, you have the notion of varna sankara, the mixing of castes. Well, the Bible is against that. The Bible is one with the man who is meaty. And so obviously, you should not uh, intermix different ethnic groups. And indeed, at one point, God orders as punishment uh, for uh, a foreign tribe that is to be defeated, that they will be punished with intermixing with intermarriage, that they will lose their racial purity. When um, the Israelites return from uh, exile in Babylon, they come back to the promised land, and there they find that the lower classes who have remained behind have mixed with foreigners. So they split up all these marriages. They force them to divorce their foreign spouses and their mixed children and return to the purity of the Israelite stock. Those who don't have to be killed or if they're fast enough to be exiled. But so they don't want these people to contaminate the tribe with their mixed genes. There is an anthropologist called uh, Mary Douglas, who some 50 years ago has tried to find the key to the biblical rules of food purity. There are certain animal species which you are allowed to eat, others which you are not allowed to eat. Um, for example, uh, well, animals that are in harmony with the element they live in, those you can eat. You see, fish have this flowing, curving sort of form, and, and you know they, they fit in with the flowing of the water. By contrast, shrimps have this complicated uh, structure. They don't fit in with the water, so those you can't eat. You know, part of these rules have been taken over in Islam, like uh, Salman Rushdie somewhere describes his break with Islam. So when he grew up and he started doubting Islam, he also doubted these purity rules. So you see, he went to some, some fish and chips uh, uh, stall in England, and there he bought uh, shrimps, and he ate shrimps. So he, he totally broke the taboo of shrimps, and he found them very tasty. But so, you see, this, this prohibition on shrimps follows a certain logic. Uh, as for, uh, it's a bit of a sidestep, but I might as well uh, deal with it now. The prohibition on pork, which again was taken over in Islam. You see, modern Jews who try to use a sort of modern rationality will say, for example, that the pigs are impure because they're a halfway stage between vegetarianism and carnivorism. 
You see, poor, uh, pigs are related to elephants, for example, which are purely vegetarian. Pigs sometimes eat animal food, although predominantly they still are vegetarian. And, you know, their intestinal system is that of vegetarianism. They have long intestines, whereas lions, for example, have a very short so that they can immediately get rid of these rotting uh, animal foods. And so therefore, you see, pigs are unclean and it's better not to eat them. Now that's a modern rationalization, probably, at least according to many scholars. Uh, the reason has more to do with something very fundamental in all human societies, the concern for status. And so the, um, the cattle herders, which the Israelites were, uh, have a certain you know, contempt for agriculture, for sedentary people, the nomads feel superior. Like they live in tents. You see, the, the Israelites, you know, constantly, they, they take to the nomadic lifestyle, even if they go live in cities. You know, a, a, a modern example of this is uh, Colonel Gaddafi. When he went to the United Nations in New York, of course, you see, he was offered to the five-star hotel. Uh, yet, you see, he took the hotel room, but he brought his tent, and he set up his tent in the garden of the hotel, and he stayed there, right? So, you see, this is, this is very deeply ingrained that the nomadic lifestyle somehow is superior to the sedentary lifestyle. Now, pigs belong to the sedentary lifestyle. You see what are agriculture is? Well, they start by chopping down the forest to replace it with fields. The animals who live in the forest, the wild pigs, the boars, they are kept as, uh, they are domesticated and kept as domestic animals and their meat is eaten. So you see, <laughs> pigs are typical for the sedentary lifestyle, whereas the nomads eat beef or mutton or so. And so it is out of this concern for the superior nomadic status that the pig is shunned. Now that's the, the best, you see, the most plausible theory for this. Okay, so the Hebrew word kadosh, sacred, etymologically means separate. So you have this separation between the sacred and the profane. And so what is sacred is separate. It has to be treated separately, has to, you know, be treated with certain rules that don't apply in the profane world. And so endogamy, the rule that you can only marry within a certain community, that's an application of this principle. And so you find a number of examples in the Bible. Uh, for example, um, the case of uh, uh, Rebecca, who is the wife of uh, Isaac, the son of Abraham, um, she has two sons, Jacob and Esau. In fact, Esau is the eldest. And uh, he takes two wives from a neighboring tribe, the Hittites. Whereas the younger son, Jacob, he goes to his uncle and there uh, marries the uncle's two daughters. Um, uh, uh, Leah and Rachel. Um, and so that is according to the rules. Re Rebecca is very happy that he marries two fellow tribeswomen, whereas she's very unhappy that Esau has married two foreigners. Now, normally, the authority over the tribe would pass on from the father to the eldest son. Yet she manipulates things and arranges that somehow the, uh, the succession goes to the youngest son. Why? Because he's, uh, he's more ethnically pure. Or you have the case of uh, Dina. Dina is the daughter of this Jacob that you just mentioned. So with his two wives and with their two uh, maidservants, uh, which he also uh, uh, consumes, so to speak, 
Uh, he um, has 13 children in total, 12 sons, who are the progenitors of the 12 tribes of Israel, and uh, one daughter. And so the daughter falls in love with another foreign tribe, this, someone from another foreign tribe, the Shechemites. And um, they arrange for a marriage. And the, uh, the, the sons of Jacob insist that they have to be circumcised, just like the Israelites themselves are. And they're very adaptive, you see. They, they agree, OK, we'll all be circumcised. Now, if you get circumcised at an adult age, you're pretty sick for a few days. So they are all ailing, you know, they're, they're, they're bedridden. And then the uh, 12 sons storm into their city and kill everyone. Why? Well, because they don't tolerate that their sister marries a foreigner. So th this is very strongly ingrained. There are uh, modern cases, you see, even between the different sub-tribes of Israel, there is a rule of uh, endogamy. For example, there was this, uh, the, the, the chairman of the Communist Party in the Netherlands, Hugo de Groot. He was the son of a mixed marriage between Sephardic Jews and Ashkenazi Jews. Um, so his father and his mother were of the two groups. Ashkenazi Jews are the Jews from Central Europe, some of whom migrated to Amsterdam. And then the Sephardic Jews are the Jews from Spain and Portugal, many of whom migrated to Amsterdam also. And so the two groups remained very separate. Yet, you see, here was a case of, you see, two of them falling in love, starting a marriage. They had to move out of Amsterdam. They were not tolerated, nor by the Ashkenazi, neither by the Sephardic community. So they moved to Antwerp. That's where he grew up. Uh, so you see, this, this, this rule of endogamy is quite uh, strong. <clears throat> it's not typically Israelite. You find it in India, for example, among the tribals also. It's, it's not a Brahminical thing. Uh, among the tribals too, there is fierce, the fierce rule of endogamy. But so it existed in the Bible. You know, if they tell you that the Bible is the alternative for this ugly, vicious Hindu caste society, well, they're mistaken, or they are fooling you. <clears throat> now, this counts for the Old Testament, but not for the New Testament. You see, Jesus abolishes these laws, or at least he makes a start, <clears throat> like he abolishes food taboos. You see, he says famously, it is not what goes into the mouth, namely specific forbidden types of food, but what comes out of the mouth, slander and lies and foul talk and so on, that makes man impure. You have the story of the adulterer's wife, uh, which probably is not uh, original. It only appears in biblical manuscripts a few centuries after the fact. Anyway, I mean, it's, it's one of the most beloved scenes in the gospel. Uh, where this uh, woman is going to be stoned as a punishment for adultery. So all the men gather, they pick up stones in order to throw at her. And then Jesus comes and he says, yeah, well, um, okay, you're going to stone her. I suggest that those who are without sin cast the first stone. And so the men become pensive, uh, well, now you come to mention it, you see, I've also sinned my bit in my life. Especially the elders, you see, they come first. They have a long record of sinfulness. They realize, well, yeah, you know, if I'm going to punish her, I ought to be punished myself. So all of them gradually leave. And then Jesus says to the woman, oh, 
Where are they? You know, ha have they not condemned you? Well, I don't condemn you either. Now go and sin no more. Um, but so, you see, this is a step away from the law. And in Christianity, this is very important, the idea that, you see, the law is something from the Old Testament and Jesus has freed us from the law. This becomes the official line of the church with St. Paul, who abolishes the law as such. So, you know, very uh, foundationally, the, um, the rule that uh, Israelites have to get circumcised no longer applies. So all these non-circumcised pagans can become Christian without going through the uh, special effort of circumcision. But all the other laws also lapse. This is, for instance, why uh, there are no taboos on menstruation in Christianity. You see, in, in most religions, in most cultures around the world, you have some kind of taboo on menstruating women. Like in Judaism, they are not allowed to enter their own kitchen. They have to stay away from the family for a few days. And so you have rules like that uh, all over. Menstruating women are not supposed to enter temples, for example. So in Christianity, this falls away, not because they're so woman-friendly or something. No, it's just because the old system, 613 laws in Deuteronomy, in the Old Testament, suddenly don't apply anymore. And um, so this, this anomie, this lawlessness, is typical for Christianity. Um, so they do follow certain laws, namely the law of the land, which when they start is the mighty Roman Empire, you know, against which they're, they're way too weak. You know, they, they couldn't change it even if they wanted to. Um, but what counts as law is what the Church Father St. Augustine says, love and do what you will. That is to say, if what you're contemplating of doing is inspired by love, I think it's a modern sentimental translation that the more proper translation is charity. But so if, if what you intend to do is charitable, is inspired by nothing else but charity, then you must do it. Then it's okay. So if you doubt, you see, if this is really uh, in, in tune with the law of the land or with certain moral principles that you've heard about, well, no, you see, the consideration of charity is the decisive one. So, uninformed anti-Christian polemic, which you do find a lot among Hindus, uh, this often cites these Old Testamentic laws about stoning, for example, that really don't apply to Christianity anymore. Inequality is totally taken for granted by both Jesus and St. Paul. Like Paul writes, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. The Christians don't think of abolishing slavery. I, I've seen some modern Christian-inspired movies from the United States where they pretend that the difference between Christians and the pagans in the Roman Empire was that the Christians wanted to abolish slavery. This is mendacious propaganda. Uh, you see, Jesus took the existing inequalities for granted. He doesn't really talk about it, but he takes them for granted. He never goes against them. Uh, St. Paul is very explicit in condoning slavery. Like uh, he says, uh, slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear. This he writes repeatedly, and he never writes anything in the opposite sense. 
These uh, injunctions by St. Paul were invoked by Christian slave masters in the 19th century when the Christian community itself finally got affected by the struggle between maintaining slavery or abolishing slavery. So the abolitionists realized that they were going against the Bible. They thought that maybe some, some higher interpretation of certain biblical principles meant that at least today, not in Jesus' time, but today, slavery would not be justified anymore. Uh, but many other Christians said, well, the, the Bible is clear enough. Obviously, this is the, the rule according to the Bible that slaves should obey their masters. So this is what we're doing. We're defending biblical principles. South Africa, the same. Uh, first slavery, then later when that was no longer possible. The apartheid system was defended by the Dutch Calvinists. Now, you do have a certain movement against slavery in a limited sense. In the seventh century, you had a Merovingian dynasty in what is now part of France and Belgium. And in there, there was a queen called Balthilde. Actually, she, she started as a pagan princess. She was abducted by Christian slave traders. So she grew up as a slave, but she had the good fortune of catching the eye of King Clovis II, and he fancied her sexually. So he married her, which automatically meant that she was freed from slavery. Then later, uh, her husband died. She had a few sons, but they were still small. So for some years, she was a regent. And in that capacity, she abolished slavery among Christians. So you could still take pagans as slaves. And not too far away to the east or from Byzantine to the north, you had the Slavic population. And so they were hunted down to serve as slaves. In fact, that's where the word slave comes from. It is originally an ethnic term for the Slavs. Later, this is applied in the colonies to the, uh, the Native Americans, the blacks and so on, who are not Christians yet. <clears throat> then you have colonial Christianity, um, where, of course, you have a history of slavery, uh, but you also get the history of abolitionism in the British Empire, you see, after it is uh, free thinkers, anti-Christians in France who start the movement against slavery, who first abolished slavery in the French territories in, 1894, in 1794. Uh, so then it gradually contaminates the Christians. And so in the British Empire, it is William Wilberforce, member of parliament, and great patron of the mission enterprise in the uh, territories of the East India Company, who also advocates abolition of slavery. And so ultimately he succeeds. And then the next move is that the British Empire not only abolishes slavery in the British Empire, but also starts pressurizing other countries to abolish it too. Uh, like, for example, the Crimea War between Turkey and Russia. Okay, the, 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 the Russians were in a position to defeat the Turks. The Turks needed help. So Britain said, okay, we'll, we'll help you. And effectively, they, they won the, the Crimea War, but on condition that you abolish slavery. And so the Turks formally abolished slavery. This was, in effect, in the, the Turkish territories, not in the Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire, where, for instance, Saudi Arabia only abolished slavery in 1962 under international pressure. <clears throat> so um, now we move from the topic of slavery to other forms of inequality. 
There is a missionary in the 17th century, Roberto de Nobili, who lives in South India, who is fluent in Sanskrit and Tamil. You know, you have to give it to the Christian missionaries that they were very dedicated. They knew what they wanted and they did what it takes. So um, he, he was pretty successful at conversion. He also saw that, you see, converting low caste people may be a bit easier. But you see, if you want to get Hindus to convert, they should have high caste conversions to, to follow, to emulate. So it's important, he thought, that Brahmins get converted. So he dressed up like a Brahmin, you see, he made sure that he did everything correctly the way Brahmins expect. And so it was, uh, it was pursuant to this that he asked uh, the Pope to uh, accept the practice of caste within the Catholic Church. So in 1623, Pope Gregory XV gave permission to keep up caste distinctions within the church. So far, there were no caste distinctions within the church. Why? Not because the church was against caste distinctions, but because all the Christians belong to the same caste. Indeed, you see, within the caste system, it was so organized that when the refugee community of Syrian Christians settled in India, they effectively filled one slot within the caste system. But so now you see conversion started and you had low caste converts and high caste converts. And so they were separated in Catholic churches. So in older churches, you do find situations like different gates for high caste and low caste people. Originally, there was often a curtain between the seats of the high caste and the low caste people. The British uh, made another contribution to caste uh, consciousness. They hardened and perpetuated caste with the code of gentle law, which is their uh, interpretation of the Manu Smriti. And they bring in caste categories in the census so that everybody goes through a moment of reflection. Oh yeah, what caste am I? What shall I fill out in the census paper. And so that strongly uh, increases the, 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 the sense of belonging to a caste among Indians. Because in, in, in Hindu society, caste was a relatively fluid and, and very complex concept, which the British greatly simplified, but also hardened. And you see, they, they increased any rivalry between castes, which will go on and, and increase even more under independence. Now, the British had no problem really in principle with the caste system because they were totally used to the phenomenon of social hierarchy. So in India, uh, sorry, in England, you have a very strong uh, class consciousness, even more than on the continent. On the continent too, of course, you had the difference between uh, the nobility and the commoners, they were strictly speaking also endogamous groups. People from the nobility were not really expected to marry a commoner. And so I, I remember in my life even, if some member of a royal family married a commoner, that was news. That was still deemed special. Now it's accepted. Um, uh, but and, and then among the commoners, you also had, had degrees. I mean, some, some factory uh, CEO would not like his daughter to marry uh, a street sweeper or something. Um, so the idea of inequality was not at all problematic. And so that they took certain specific forms in India that they didn't take in Europe. Yeah, well, why not, you see? That, that was the whole business of colonization. You would you know, conquer and administer societies that were different from your own. So that they had some specific forms of inequality in India did not make a difference to the general acceptance of social inequality. 
Racism, of course, was also part of the zeitgeist. Not strictly of Catholic or of Christian doctrine. Uh, when you see, for example, in, um, in the, the first centuries of Christianity, you see that you see Jesus was not really very different from the Romans. He was a Middle Easterner, he was a sort of dark white, you know. Um, but a bit, you know, uh, how do you call it, uh, suntanned. Uh, when they went to Northern Europe, now there maybe there was a visible difference, but you see that was not consequential. When you see medieval paintings from my country, for example, uh, you see Jesus simply depicted as a typical Northern European. And the houses and the landscapes and so on are typical for whatever the painter is used to. Uh, this also works in the opposite direction. In Ethiopia, for example, you have one of the first churches. Jesus there is depicted as an Ethiopian. You see, they, 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 they don't care about racial differences. Indeed, the whole theology of Jesus' uh, incarnation, you know, of God coming down to earth, is precisely that God is becoming one of us. And so even if not at all historically correct, theologically it is very correct that today in Hong Kong, in, in, in you know, Christian communities, they have a Chinese Christ. And so you had an Ethiopian Christ, you had a Flemish Christ, and so on. You see, adapted to the local uh, standards, and that was just normal. That was really uh, in tune with Christian theology. However, when the um, consciousness of the Old Testament is revived by Protestantism, then you go back to the biblical sense of uh, ethnic hierarchy, ethnic endogamy, and there you, for instance, get the uh, justification of black slavery specifically with the biblical story of Ham. The story is that uh, uh, after the floods, which uh, Noah uh, survived, Noah and his family, so the three sons of Noah are Sem, Ham, and Japheth. Japheth is supposed to become the ancestor of the Indo-Europeans. Sem, of course, is the uh, ancestor of the Middle Easterners. And Ham is supposed to be the ancestor of the Africans. Now, Ham uh, commits a sin against the dignity of his father. And so he is punished with the mark of Ham. It's not really described what this mark is, but at any rate, he's physically recognizable. And so skin color obviously is physically recognizable. So this mark of Ham was taken to justify the enslavement of blacks. So here again, there is, there is a direct connection between the Bible and the history of slavery. And with the increasing distance of modern men from the Bible and the abolition of slavery. Hindus often uh, ascribe any uh, trace of Hindu bashing or what they now call uh, Hindu phobia to racism. Now, this is totally anachronistic. You see, Hindus feel very brave when they beat a dead horse. You see, the colonization was beaten. I mean, you see, Hindus didn't get decolonization for free. You see, they did a number of things that pressurized the British to leave. But that's long ago. And so in the British age, there was plenty of racism. Of course, there's no denying that, not at all. However, today, the state religion in the West, if you don't know yet, is anti-racism. You see, I mean, there are committees with well-paid people whose job it only is to enforce anti-racism, to look after anything that, that 
somehow reminds us of racism and to censor that, to defeat that, to ban that, to cancel that. And so maybe some people, you see, somewhere within their skulls harbor some, some remainder of racism. They're certainly not going to say it in public. And so, so racism is totally out of public discourse in the West. And in fact, the Hindu bashing starts from abolitionist anti-racism. How so? You see, Westerners have, of course, practiced slavery and specifically racial slavery. But they have also abolished it. And so now in the woke movement, you have all this uh, reminiscing of Western uh, racial slavery. That's, of course, in itself true. But they totally black out the equally historical fact of the abolition of slavery. Now, in Western consciousness, that still plays a certain role. You see, after having abolished racist slavery, in the case of the American Civil War, it was at the cost of 2% of the lives of white Americans. Mm? So, you see, they, they, they waged the war for it, the complete destabilization of the southern states. You know, they paid a very high price for it, really to abolish uh, slavery and um, or here I can um, mention the Belgian contribution to the abolition of slavery. You've all heard about the evil king Leopold II and you see even from intra-Belgian debate that you wouldn't know about, I am very much ready to condemn him as a, uh, someone who played a really evil role. Nevertheless, nevertheless, he was our Abraham Lincoln. He was the emancipator of the slaves. You see, he um, managed to corner the Congo as his private colony. It was not a Belgian colony, it was his own colony. And he got that by, among other things, promising to abolish slavery there. You see, there were Arab slavers who you know, did good business uh, taking numerous blacks as slaves and then selling them. So he promised to finish this. Only when he became the ruler of this territory, well, he found that he was doing good business with these Arabs. They paid taxes and so on. So he wasn't in a hurry to abolish slavery. It was a local uh, army commander, Francis Danis, who got into some skirmishes with the local Arabs. And then he escalated it to a full war. If he had lost the war, he certainly would have been court-martialed for disobeying his orders of staying on good terms with the Arabs. Uh, but he won the war. So this is the only war that Belgium ever won, 1894. And uh, so then, of course, he was knighted and he was celebrated and shown off internationally, because now at least, Leopold could, you know, make true on his promise of abolishing slavery. So that, that looked good. Then the next thing he did was exploiting the blacks terribly in a way that formerly wasn't slavery, you know, capitalist exploitation. So I'm not at all trying to justify Leopold, but nevertheless, formally speaking, he is politically responsible for the abolition of slavery. Anyway, so this is part of the Western experience. And so many Westerners feel that today they have a duty to pursue this struggle till the end, to abolish racial slavery wherever it still exists. And where does it exist? In the caste system. You see, because of the Aryan invasion theory, uh, many people think that the caste system is some kind of apartheid imposed by the white Aryan invaders upon the dark aboriginals. There is much uh, scientific evidence against this scenario, but anyway, that's what popularly is still believed. And so that is a fertile soil 
for the, um, the, the Hindu bashing propagators. So, I mean, most people are not really concerned about India. You know, there is in India this, this story that the, the West is against India and they don't want India to come up economically and so on. You see, this is all self-flattery. This is giving India far more importance than it has. India is doing very well. It is gaining in importance and so on. But that has nothing to do with the existence of Hindu bashing. And um, so it, it has certain explainable reasons. And so this, this fertile soil of a desire to abolish racial slavery is a, a large part of it. Okay, so um, this was about Christianity. What about Islam? Well, you see, there is the story, of course, that Islam has brought equality ever since um, Mohammed Habib, the historian, in the 1920s, and M. N. Roy, the founder of the Communist Party, also at that time. The Indian masses were yearning for Islam. They wanted to convert away from the oppressive Hindu caste system because Islam promised them equality. Now, this is totally unsupported by primary evidence. And indeed, you see what we know about the processes of conversion. And I don't mean conversion at knife point, but you know, formally voluntary con conversions again, have, still have nothing to do with this factor of in, uh, inequality. Or rather, they do have to do with inequality, but in the opposite sense. The fact is that under Muslim rule, it was an advantage to be a Muslim. For example, if two Hindu businessmen had some business conflict and they went to court, then the one who was the first to convert to Islam would automatically win his court case. Or, for example, many urban craftsmen who are the bulk of Hindu converts to Islam uh, had better chances of employment at the Muslim courts if they converted. So it was always an advantage to convert to Islam. Same thing under Christian rule, uh, under the Portuguese especially, even to some extent under the British. You see, the, the British didn't actually practice conversion, but certainly the missionaries had the ear of the colonial authorities. So in some situations, again, it was advantageous to belong to the Christian community. There has never been a time in Indian history when the Hindus were oppressing the minorities. You see, this is a familiar trope among the, the Hindu bashing crowd, but this has never existed. You see, what this is is a pure projection of essentially the American situation. You see, whether affirmative action is the correct policy uh, as an answer to the historical fact of uh, oppression of the blacks, that is a, a political question that has to be decided today by the people concerned. But the historical fact that the blacks have been oppressed, now that is there. You can't deny that. Well, there is no corresponding fact like that in India. The Hindus have never oppressed the minorities. The Hindus have nothing to, to compensate, to, to historically pay for or something. Whereas the opposite, of course, existed a lot. More fundamentally, so historically, of course, there has been inequality between Islam and the rest. But even within Islam, there is no idea of equality. The Quran itself says, you know, or supposedly Allah himself says in the Quran, we elevate some several steps higher than others so that they can look upon others as their inferiors. At another place, well, 
This, in fact, uh, is repeated in two places. Your Lord gives in abundance to whom he wants and sparsely to whom he chooses. This is part of the Islamic uh, doctrine of fatalism. You know, everything has been decreed by God and ultimately there is nothing you can do about it. This is called takdir in Islam. Like an example of it, um, during the caravan raids organized by Muhammad, they take uh, hostages. So they, they, they take the caravan, they kill as many people as is necessary in order to take possession of the caravan. Then you see in the caravan, usually there are some passengers, women, so they're taken as hostages. And of course, Muhammad wants to make money. So he sends word to their families, okay, you see, we have your women, you can have them back, but you have to pay for it. So when, while waiting for the ransom money, these women were there in the captivity of these uh, Muhammad's men. And so they say, well, you don't expect us, after all the fighting and so on we have done, to just look at these women and not do anything. And so Muhammad says, yeah, okay, you can rape them. But, uh, of course, me as a robber chieftain, says Muhammad, I also have my code of honor. I want to give back the things that I've abducted in their original condition. So you should not get them pregnant. So you have to practice coitus interruptus. That's what he says the first time. But then later, you see, there are a number of caravan raids, 80 or something. And so later on, on a similar occasion, Muhammad says, well, actually, you know, you don't have to do it. You don't have to practice birth control. Because if God doesn't decide that a child should be produced, then it won't happen. So, you know, you can have sex just the way you want because it's only God who decides, you know, whether there's going to be a child or not. See, and so this is a very uh, deep conviction among Muslims that everything is predetermined. That's why, you see, the laws of nature, which are so central in Hinduism, Artha, already since the Vedic times, uh, are, you know, conventionally accepted, but there's always the sense of, yeah, but if God one day decides that the law of gravity is not going to apply today, then that's going to happen. So men can't do miracles, but God can do miracles. He can overrule the laws of nature. So you have this idea of uh, takdir, of, of fate, of destiny. And so one form of destiny is whether you are rich or poor whether you are upper class or lower class. And so you should not, you know, resent this. You should not revolt against this because this is ungrateful to the unfathomable, unfathomable will of God. Another quote, to some God has given more than to others. Those, who he, has just, those he has thus privileged shall not grant their slaves an equal share of what they themselves have. Would they deny God's goodness? So if you profit from God's goodness, if God has chosen to privilege you, you should not try to change this. You know, as a rich person, you should not try to make the poor richer. As a slave owner, you should not try to abolish slavery. Because God has willed it like that. So to look for equality in pre-modern religions is fruitless. Equality is a typically modern concept. Like just now, as I speak, it's only a few days ago that Mohan Bhagwat, the top man of the RSS, 
has said that uh, God has made all men equal. It's only the vile, evil, vicious, you know, priests, the pundits, which means the Brahmins, though he later denied that he had accused the Brahmins, but we all know what pundit means, um, that uh, they have made men unequal, they have instituted caste. You know, I mean, historically, that's very doubtful. As Dr. Ambedkar himself wrote, you see, okay, I, I, I hold uh, the Brahmins guilty of serious things. Indeed, I dare say they were guilty. But to, in, to create the caste system that was beyond their mettle, that they could not have done. And so in spite of this, uh, Mohan Bhagwat bends over backwards to please the Hindu bashers and accuse the Brahmin class among Hindus of instituting the caste system. Anyway, uh, so contrary to that, some Hindu apologists insist that caste is totally un-Hindu. And in fact, that's also what, uh, what Bhagwat also implies, that some bad elements among Hindus have instituted caste, but really, Hinduism is directed to God, and so he was against caste. Okay, now you see that that's a totally useless, senseless debate. In pre-modern religions, inequality was taken for granted. And so in different religions, in different countries, in different cultures, you may have different forms of inequality, but inequality is always there. Today, of course, under the, the woke uh, movement, the idea of equality, of human rights, of social justice is often taken to ridiculous lengths. And so it's frowned upon. Uh, like socialists, for example, have often advocated equality of outcomes, whereas classical liberals have favored an e uh, a formal equality, an equality before the law, but from then on, you're on your own. And so some people will be more successful than others. Some people will end up rich, others will end up poor, but that's all under the rule of equality. So they have equal chances at the start, but what they make of it may be different. Whereas leftists have insisted that there should be an equality of outcomes. So they should end up they should all win the race. So you see, that's, uh, that's a silly exaggeration. However, the principle of equality, there, there is much to be said for it. And indeed, I, I can hardly see how you can conceive of social justice without presupposing equality before the law. And so, like the Belgian constitution says explicitly, all Belgians are equal before the law. The Indian constitution is more complicated. It also says this. The all Indian citizens are equal before the law, but then it makes lots of exceptions. So, in some respects, the Hindus versus the minorities are not equal. The, uh, the low castes versus the high castes are not equal. And the Indian constitution guarantees the right of governments to conduct policies where they institute inequality on a caste basis and so on. But you see, that's a different topic. Uh, but so in principle, the idea of equality before the law is very commendable. I'm all for it. So today, um, Islam takes itself very seriously. Christianity tries to morph into more modern forms, like it doesn't want to remind people of its own very strong scriptural basis for the acceptance of slavery. Whereas in Islam, this, uh, you know, there is only one Islam. There's not a modern versus a pre-modern Islam, uh, or a moderate versus a radical Islam. There's just Islam. 
And uh, it's only in certain polemical contexts or in, in interfaith dialogue concepts that they try to present a more modern face. Uh, but so there is no serious self-rethinking. There is no real attempt to abolish slavery. Today, most Muslim societies don't have slavery under modern pressure, under Western pressure. Uh, but you see, when they get the chance, and the ISIS uh, is the, the prime example from 2014 onwards, in their territories in Syria and Iraq, they reinstituted slavery. They started practicing slavery of unbelievers. You know, Christianity is a far more complicated case. So ever since the Enlightenment, they have interiorized some Enlightenment values and uh, tried to look uh, modern. You have a similar thing, which few people know about, in, uh, in China, in Confucianism where the reformer Kang Yo Wei, in the beginning of the 20th century, also uh, advocated a certain egalitarian utopianism, which he somehow managed to harmonize with Confucianism, which is an ancient, you know, humane, but essentially feudal ideology, where, of course, there is plenty of inequality between upper class and lower class, between men and women, between older and younger, and so on. The Arya Samaj tried to force Hindu Dharma into an egalitarian mode, and partly their argument was correct. They insist, for example, that in the Rig Veda there is no caste. This is correct. And even at the fag end of the Rig Veda, you get the Purusha Sukta, which is often cited as justification for the caste system. Now, in fact, in the Purusha Sukta, you have mention of the four layers of society, the four Varnas, which exist in any advanced society. And so they are described, their typical functions are described. But what is not described or prescribed is how they are or how they should be recruited. It doesn't say, in order to become a priest, you have to be the son of a priest. And indeed, in the Rig Veda, there are descriptions like, you see, some priest who says, my father was a craftsman. Uh, so th this didn't apply at all. And dogamy, again, was very far from them. You see, the, your father could be this thing, your mother another. Um, you have the classical example, for instance, of Veda Vyasa. The sage par excellence, for whom you have the festival of Guru Purnima. So his father was a sage, Parashara, and he was conceived out of wedlock. You see, Parashara wanted to cross the river, and there was this girl with a ferry boat, um, Satyavati. So she ferries him across, but halfway they, you know, get enamored of each other. They stop at an island in the middle of the river. They make love, and the result is a son who later becomes Veda Vyasa, the editor of the Vedas. So they are not of the same caste, and yet he is the sage par excellence. Uh, so you see this idea of uh, first no caste, then patrilineal caste, where the caste of the father is important, but not that of the mother, and then ultimately the, the caste system as we know it historically, with endogamy, where father and mother have to belong to the same community, that's a gradual historical process. According to geneticists, the division of Hindu society into box type separate communities is not older than the second century AD, you know, after Christ. Uh, so it's by Hindu standards, fairly recent. Uh, but it's a, it's a historical fact, nevertheless. And so the Arya Samaj wanted to reform this situation, but they could very correctly point to the caste-free situation in the Rig Veda. So they could justify their reformist as a form of going back to the roots. 
Now, why uh, monotheism? The, um, you see, I mean, many people in India, including many secular Hindus, uh, think that monotheism automatically leads to, or, or at least favors, social equality, whereas polytheism doesn't. Well, the assumption is that if heaven is undivided, is not divided between different gods, but is one, then earth, meaning mankind, is also undivided, is also one. Well, that's not so certain. Uh, I mean, take the, the, the physical metaphor of heaven and earth. You look up to heaven, you see something that is common for all. Everybody can see the same heaven. Whereas, Earth is very divided. You see, you, even, you know, there's a river, you don't know what's happening on the other side of the river. And you see, Earth is, you know, most of the Earth you can't see. And many places that you can see are still hidden because there's a forest there, there are houses there, whatever. So, Earth is divided, heaven is one. And... <laughs> And that also counts at a theological level. You can have one God, and yet you have, can have all kinds of divisions in mankind. And indeed, that's how the Old Testament sees it. That's how the New Testament sees it. Now, Christians say, ah, but we're all children of God. To which Hindus answer, ah, but we have the slogan, Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam. The whole world is one family which is pretty much synonymous with the Christian saying that we're all children of God. You see, the fatherhood of God, we are all children of the Father, which means that we are all brothers of one another. We are one family. So that's exactly the same thing. So Hindus who think that they're very original by saying Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, you know, suffer from the typically Hindu problem of insularity. They talk within their own echo chamber. They stay within their own bubble. You know, if they'd look outside, they would see that what they are so proud of is actually quite common. The statement that we are all one family is pretty banal. At any rate, it's also being said in another form by the Christian missionaries. Then more philosophical Hindus say, ah, in Vedanta, you have the idea that the core of myself is Atman, is the self, and the self is totally equal to the divine, to the absolute, Brahma. And my self is equal to Brahman, and your self is also equal to Brahman. So ultimately, you and I are the same. Or at the very, very, very least, we are equal. And so... You see, whether you are all children of the Creator or you are all different faces of the one Brahma, you know, okay, at, at some level you're all the same, but you're also all different. Like, take for example, a father and a son. The father and the son are not equal. You see, the father can order the son, can teach the son, can berate the son, can reprimand the son, and so on, not the reverse. And yet, they are both children of God. Yet, they are both faces of the same Brahma. So, the fact that in an absolute sense, they are equal, does not mean that in a worldly context, they are equal. So, you see, theologically, this is interesting to say that at some level, we're all the same. But in the world, you see, this doesn't change anything about the existing inequality. So, you see these maxims, both in Christianity and in Vedanta, perfectly coexist with inequality in real life. So, metaphysical equality or sameness does not imply social equality. So, if you want to do something about uh, social inequality, 
you know, I wish you good luck. You know, there's a lot to be said for that. But you see, to, to justify the whole operation by bringing in a certain monist or monotheist theology, that won't help. Thanks a lot.